Well, your interesting question is, what kind of biotech medical applications do you envision for Cardano? The last question of the day, because I do have to get to another engagement, but uh, I want to spend some time with you guys because I love you. I love my people. You're the best. So we've had an enormous amount of discussions about my dad, my brother, and I, and others about what can we do in the anti-aging regenerative medicine biotechnology space to be able to provide the maximum level of value. Uh, so, so much of health and aging is because of lifestyle and poor integrative care. You eat too much, you smoke, you eat the wrong things, you don't exercise, um, you don't, you're not aware of certain things brewing and so you let them get out of control and they go from fixable to not fixable. Uh, you're not really getting the best health care when you consume care because care is transactional. They're maximizing RVUs. Doctors don't really have a relationship with patients anymore. In many cases, doctors are basically told how to practice by hospitals, insurance companies. Other people come and inflict that on them. So research is hard. I do that for a living with Cardano and IO, and we've built a center of excellence around academic research in a particular domain. Now, the first cognitive mistake you can get yourself into is believing that competence in one domain equates to competence in another. Every academic discipline has rules, culture, uh, sacred cows, and all other things. And your knowledge in one doesn't necessarily transfer into the other. Now, in biotechnology, there's an overlap with software. Computer science is eating biotech. We have bioinformatics and we're learning tons of stuff about how to connect genetics to software engineering. And you can look no further to the Moderna vaccine. There's a great article in New Yorker that talked about how they designed it in two days with a computer model. And that was the same thing they started injecting people's arms in December. So they had the vaccine in January of 2020. So there's some overlap, but let's be clear here. Patient care, no overlap. Uh, you know, thinking about the nature and politics of medicine, what is wellness, separating the pseudoscience from the cutting edge science, from the placebo, from actually truly allopathically verified therapeutics. These are all very different and difficult things. So the question is, where do you start? Do you start on the clinical or do you start on the research side when you want to enter the medical discipline? And we thought a lot about this. And our family has the clinical experience. And my father's an internist. My brother's an internist. Uh, they collectively, the family, have been practicing medicine since the 50s. Uh, you know, there's a lot of knowledge there, a lot of patients there, a lot of people you've had to deal with. Every situation of life, from uh, West Nile to Lhasa to whatever, you know, anything you can imagine, they've probably seen at some point in their career. And they've also seen a lot of failures. So if you're thinking about anti-aging, probably the first thing to do is say, fix the low-hanging fruit. And that buys you 10, 20, 30 years, depending on the facts and circumstances of lifespan that is mostly healthy. Well, that's a good starting point because you're not inventing new things. You're just combining things together. Uh, that's where you start and you do that with a concierge practice. And then over time you kind of white label it and grow it and franchise it. Uh, and you build all kinds of product lines and you bring technologies together. For example, there's a company called Viome and they actually send a test to you. They take a stool sample. They, they take a look at your particular microbiome, which is very personal. And then they create a customized recommendation of what you need to do to optimize it. Microbiome, we're starting to discover, is one of the single most important determinants of your health. If you get it wrong, you, you might have depression. Wow, that's crazy. You know, there's all kinds of crazy inflammatory autoimmune disorders you could have that transform into significant issues that may require surgery or create chronic conditions you'll have for the rest of your life if that's out of whack. Cognitive health. There's so much stuff in performance neuroscience these days, and there's so many tools we're developing to discover that. And, and if you don't use those and you have poor practices, your cognitive decline accelerates, and you wake up at 50, you can't remember where your car keys are. It happens to us all at some point. So those are just two examples, but there's dozens. And you integrate those together into a concierge care, and you can create a wellness group and a care team with that wellness group. 
Uh, and it's a combination of neurology and uh, geneticists. Like for example, you can sequence the entire human genome now with a company called Nebula for just a few hundred dollars. So you can do genomic medicine, you can do genomic nutrition. So you bring a nutritionist on, all these types of things. Um, you do a whole body ultrasound. Those are really cheap too. I think it's only 70,000 to buy them. We've been pricing various different images and equipment. So we're gonna build a state-of-the-art clinic, a state-of-the-art wellness team with that clinic. And we're gonna bring in a very diverse set of skills to augment the clinical skills that we already have. Then we're gonna add some researchers and their job is to scour all of the peer-reviewed literature and look at things like hyperbaric chambers and photobiomodulation and PEMF and other things that are around, in some cases have been around for a long time. And there's a lot of efficacy signals that they have, but there's also some pseudoscience overlap there. We need to pull those two things apart and find bespoke treatments. Then you can start covering verticals like traumatic brain injuries, you, long COVID. There's even a blood test they're developing to help detect that. And there's a whole bunch of interventions that can be done. Now, once you do that, you have a swarm of intelligence that is well-suited to talk about the practicality of wellness. In addition, you have a product to consume that will overall give you 10, 20, 30 extra years of life and healthiness and dramatically lower your chances of chronic conditions at the tail end of life, okay? And also physical stuff like mindfulness-based stress reduction, exercise science, these types of things. You need, you need to pull them all together. Then in parallel, once you have that group established, it takes three to five years to build a center of excellence. You hire your medical scientists and you start really aggressively looking into the low-hanging fruit of regenerative medicine. Uh, in particular, wound treatment looks really solid in my view. Uh, you know, it's low-hanging fruit because you can see it. And you can even, if you want to, A-B test things. So you just take twins and you cut both of them in the same place you have your placebo on one and you put the medicine on the other and you just see which one heals. And that's a pretty damn good control sample, I think. Uh, and it uh, tells you a lot about it and they're genetically identical. So that's, you know, even as an N of two, it's a good set, you know, so you can design all kinds of studies where you can, you can do some pretty cool stuff and it either works or it doesn't. And you can physically see that it's working and there's an unending supply of burn victims, war, uh, injuries and all kinds of horrific uh, surface level injuries uh, there. And there's great product lines like anti-aging creams and uh, accelerated healing, diabetic ulcers and so forth. So it's a big industry. And it turns out the same things that would close that wound and return sense and sensation to that would also be incredibly useful for antibiotic alternatives because these wounds get infected a lot. So you need to develop something to put there. And also you can go deeper into the body once you've developed that acumen. So the first wave of anti-aging there we've been thinking about has been around how do you build a team of excellence that really understands the intercellular matrix, really understands exosomes, really understands um, things you can put into gels uh, that when you apply to a wound, those gels will also be antibacterial and potentially antiviral to limit the possibility of infection. And then combine that with other therapeutics like hyperbaric treatment, for example, which has been shown to accelerate healing. Uh, so that's phase one as you're building that center of excellence. And you can do clinical trials rapidly. There's a lot of BARDA money there. There's, there's lots of things to pursue. Once you have that, you have a lot of domain mastery over synthetic biology and stem cells and all this other stuff. And as a result of that, you have the capacity to then move deeper into the body and start talking about repairing organs and other such things. That's further off, like 2030, 2035, 2040. Um, but I'm 34, so I don't really have a huge rush in that. You know, we have the luxury of time. And also you need for certain things to catch up. Meanwhile, your wellness group is evolving and they're starting to create wearables and AI-assisted medicine, build peer review, uh, put the peer review process into chart review. So, you know, because you're doing concierge care with these things, you can have... Uh, doctors inside the group audit each other's charts on a regular basis. And then you can also do community-oriented care. So while you're not taking care of your core patient group or doing procedures within that group, you can give free health care to people in the community. Uh, and you also can be on the forefront of diagnostics, both imaging technology as well as laboratory technology. The reality is a lot of doctors 
are only aware of a small set of the tests that can be run. There's like the universe of all apps that one can do. They're, they're pretty extensive. Uh, so if you bring some specialty in-house, then you can start discovering all these exotic things. And if you have the right laboratory, you can actually do them at a very low cost. And for certain patient cases, you can, especially complex conditions where you don't really have the right root cause and your differential is unclear, you can actually very much uh, pursue that with vigor. As for imaging, you know, when you actually look at the economic things like MRIs, especially three Tesla MRIs, um, it doesn't really cost too much to go from one to a hundred images a scans a day. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's not too bad. Uh, so uh, for us, you know, it just makes sense to build that wellness group as, and create a center of excellence there and really imagine what great primary care looks like in the 21st century. Uh, and then with all that domain expertise, we have a clinical basis upon which a lens upon which to look at research. So we're starting in a practical sense. Then wound treatment seems to be the low hanging fruit. I've had multiple discussions with uh, many universities about how to do a public private partnership like what we did with Cardano. Uh, for example, I reached out to my alma mater, C. Boulder, and they have a great Institute for Regenerative Medicine, good deans there, uh, a lot of great success that they've had. So when the time comes and we have that medical scientist there, along with a team of scientists with them, like we brought with Agalos to IO, there'll be an Agalos of the Hoskinson Biotechnology Company. Then we can start talking around what is a horizon five-year effort we can pursue that will give us a therapeutic that can be FDA approved or at the very least um, clear or potentially offshore to a uh, faster regulatory structure, but still safe and effective. Uh, that can be used to be very transformative for certain classes of conditions. I'm very interested in the use of bacteriophages as an antibiotic uh, complement or replacement, uh, especially given that you can engineer them on the fly with all these new technologies we're developing. You can type them to the bacteria. Uh, I'm very interested. There was a paper, and I think it was Science, or one of these journals that came out was talking about regenerating nerves, uh, spinal cords, and things like that. And they found a way to do that with a gel. Uh, and I was like, wow, you know, that's exactly what you need for wound healing. So there's a lot there. And it's l less about being the most creative person or innovative person in the world. Uh, it's a big thing about bringing ideas together and having the right basis to combine them with ways of checking. In the case of medicine, for the care of the patient, it's about the team, not the individual. Doesn't matter if your doctor went to Harvard or not. It's about who is with the doctor in order for the doctor to do a good job. And in the case of the, the paper side of medicine, it's about how often do records get checked, reviewed, analyzed, and scrutinized. And we keep asking the question, can we do better? What is the CQI process, the continuous quality improvement process for it? So that your standard of care is always elevating and you have KPIs to always improve. And you can intervene strategically when and where you see there are problems, and either training problems or you know, better therapeutic, whatever it is. So the software is really eating that. AI is super powerful. I'm just reading of diagnostic scans, the ability to do AI annotation. It puts little red arrows around problem areas. It might be wrong. But then you say, well, what a, you know, the odds are statistically that if there's a red arrow there, there probably is something. So at least makes you look there. And you have to really look harder. And a tired radiologist at 5 p.m., just about to go to Christmas dinner, might miss it because he's tired and distracted. But he has that red arrow. He's not going to be. He's going to focus really closely on that. Uh, and that prevents hundreds of mistakes. You see, so that's software side. Well, software also will help the research of these things. You can do so much more in simulation these days, so much more in, in the lab these days than you'd imagine before you get to the patient or even the animal studies. And I think wound treatment is a great place to start. So that's that's how we're gonna build out that corpus over the next three to five years. And like IO, we'll wire in a lot of academic partnerships. It'll be a slow burner, but very meticulous. And it'll be fun because we'll have concierge practice uh, and uh, you'll have a lot of patients that come in and dad and brother get to be doctors and you know do doctor stuff and practice medicine because that's what they signed up for. That's why they got uh, that pursuit. It's a very long road to do that. Uh, but they get to be real doctors, doctors that take care of the poor and sick. And if they can't pay, it doesn't matter. Okay, don't worry about it. And uh, those who can, they cover the rest. Uh, and those who can, you have an intimate relationship with. Like, uh, you know, 
mobile medical van. It's basically a rolling uh, room. Do procedures in and, and analyze the patient. You can do ultrasounds and x-rays in it and take labs in it. Uh, it's like an RV for medicine. Get one of those. You can do house calls. And you can do any level of procedure. No one really has to come to the office. That's the level of care you can offer with concierge medicine. And you have much lower patient volume. Instead of two, 3,000, a few hundred inside the patient volume. And then you, you offset that by the community care that you offer. And every time you bring a doctor in the group to scale up the concierge practice, the doctors are auditing each other because they're doing chart review with each other and these types of things. And they create collective knowledge. And then you create study time where they actually go through journal articles together like they used to do during residency. And they probably haven't done in 20 years because residency was a long time ago. These types of things. Uh, so in terms of applications with Cardano, any place there's a supply chain, a trust factor, a way we can improve the privacy of the medical records of the patient, and there's a blockchain-based solution, like, for example, Nebula, uh, the DNA sequencing company, lets you own your DNA sequence. 23andMe doesn't do that. And they use a blockchain partner called Oasis Labs to accommodate that. All that stuff can be blockchain. If it's me, a fucking of course I'm going to put it on Cardano. And as the clinics grow and they scale out and they go to different cities, um, it could end up having hundreds of thousands or millions of patients in that paradigm. Uh, and overall, you're improving wellness uh, for everyone around. And we're always on the forefront of therapeutics. And then we have this burgeoning research group that you know exponential growth starts slow and slow, and then it really starts going fast. And those therapeutics are highly profitable. So they feed stock into improving the clinical side and feeds out improving the research lines. And then eventually you're building bioreactors and so forth. One of the reasons why I invest in Colossal, the Willy Mammoth company, we're bringing back the Willy Mammoth with them. Uh, and they're doing all the work. We're, we're probably going to end up just being the ranch and helping them with some things. We'll go down to Austin in January and have a workshop with their guys. Uh, is that they're also really thinking deeply about the artificial womb technology. Uh, and that tech can be used for a variety of things, not just bringing back mammoths, but growing organs. They're great bioreactors. And so it's, it's pretty remarkable what can be done there. Uh, and that synthetic biology that they're utilizing to create these mammoths is extremely valuable synergistically to the kinds of work one would do in regenerative medicine. Uh, and it's great to have people like George Church in the orbit and just be able to have deep, deep conversations with them. And it is a big passion of mine. Okay, so I uh, hope everybody enjoyed this. I, I really did. I'm going to have a really fun night, uh, and it's extremely good to be back. Love all of you, care for all of you, and sending compassion, joy, and kindness to your way, even to Otto Otto, hoping he gets the help that he needs. Cheers. <laughs>